please, David. Yeah. So, uh, point. Hello. Uh, I'll try to give a short uh, aperitif talk before uh, lunch. I will also speaking about the RQD and some uh, things we do with it. And uh, I will try to convince you, or not, that there might be a half integer uh, quantum Hall effect in certain materials. Uh, the possible is put in italic, why? Because uh, I will give you some evidence in favor, but I will also be critical of our own work. Uh, some things are not so clear. Sometimes it has to do with using RQD, which is a continuum theory, while the materials are, are ineffective, are not a continuum theory. And then it can be quite delicate. It's related to, I think, what Marcelo already asked, the P-square corrections, for example. Uh, I did not put it on my slides, but uh, since there was a question on the gauge parameter, I will also come back to that, uh, since uh, you can explain it in some way. Uh, there will be no magnetic field, I'm sorry, despite the, <laughs> the topic of the conference, uh, except on the last slide. Electromagnetic, Electromagnetic but even that, uh, well, <laughs> I, I don't have classical background fields, uh, unless at some point for the current. Uh, I do have some work on QCD with the magnetic field, but if the organizer asks you to speak about that, you listen, of course. And, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> so here you see there's, there's some Latin American connection, because Anna was involved in this work, Christian as well, uh, some people from Chile, some Belgians, uh, or people <laughs> working in Belgium. Uh, and actually also the big boss of the theory department here was involved, but uh, he's traveling, so you won't see him as Alexandre. So it's a mixture of, uh, let's say, quantum field theory people, which are more or less above, and then a mixture of uh, people from semiconductor physics. Uh, because I will show you some simulations of materials uh, that I didn't do myself because that's outside of my, uh, let's say, knowledge and skills. This is an overview of the talk, so I will first introduce uh, a little bit the RQED uh, with some extra comments. The motivation actually already has been given by Daniel, I think, uh, so I don't have to explain too much of the lattice uh, uh, formulation, so I will be brief on that. Then I will discuss a certain uh, mass gap structure we want, um, and if some materials can have those. With materials, uh, I mean numerical materials. Uh, I will not discuss the possibility to make these 2D materials, which is still a very different question. Uh, then I will discuss some properties of RQD, the generalized Coleman Hill theorem, and where it appears. And then I'll try to make a connection with uh, topology, and actually it's half topology, uh, put between quotation marks because that's not really topology, but it has some uh, connection with it and the bulk. And then I'll try to revisit our findings from the edge perspective, uh, since there's a famous bulk edge uh, correspondence most of the times, and the question is, does it still hold or not? Uh, well, and there will be many questions in my work, since some things are not very clear. Uh, I will try to explain them clearly, of course. Uh, this is what uh, Daniel already explained, I think, uh, where the, the fermions come from. So I will be interested in uh, this theory. The Lagrangian is given over there. Uh, it's a three-dimensional theory, uh, fermions. There's no coupling uh, yet to electromagnetism, so it works in three, it's two plus one. Uh, and there are four component spinners uh, per, per spin, which spin is the, the normal spin. And what's inside the four component spinners are two two spinners, of course, related to two quantum numbers, namely the value index uh, and the sub-lattice index. These are the kind of materials we have in mind. So uh, these are the pictures from graphene, just to give you an idea. Let's say it's honeycomb-like materials. They don't have to be exactly like that, but the most important thing is that uh, writing down a tight binding model, which is as itself as already a modeling coming, for example, from numerical simulations, and then taking the continuum limits, you end up with a theory like that. There's already a tricky point here. We will use this theory for all momentum scales, so we'll do as if it runs for p going to infinity, which might also be questionable. Uh, and we will allow the space um, or the interspace between the lattice going to zero. So that might also uh, give some problems. Uh, just for the notation, I will skip as mostly as possible the mathematics, but uh, we will use the chiral basis. A very good review is the, given by Guzinin, and probably also the book by Igor, but uh, since I don't have the book yet, I cannot recommend, but probably in the next version I will recommend that book as well. Uh, so this. 
which kind of, uh, so the previous slides was, uh, was still without mass gaps. Uh, now uh, we want to introduce a particular kind of uh, gap structure. So first of all, we want a gap uh, between the cones. That's a normal Dirac mass, you could call it. We also want a different gap uh, between what you could say the left and right chirality or the plus and minus chirality, so a kind of valley asymmetry. And we want also to lift the degeneracy between the spin. So spin up and spin down uh, bands should have a slightly different gap. And a, a fourth ingredient is that we fine tune the chemical potential to cut uh, one of the cones. So that's quite a few uh, restrictions. Uh, they will become clear why we are doing this. Uh, this idea was already launched a few years before I entered the business by Alfredo, Anna, and so on. So uh, it will become clear why we want this. These mass terms, uh, I use the same notation because I, I took it from the paper of, of Alfredo. So we will be interested in t-even mass terms and t-odd mass terms. The last one is uh, sometimes referred to as the Haldane mass uh, because it's related to the model uh, written down by Haldane a few years ago. They can be generated uh, using certain uh, properties of the materials. So uh, we will work, uh, we'll work with chiral projections explained here. Basically, we want per spin the up and the down component, so the plus and the minus. Uh, sometimes I will work in four-component spinners, but uh, to do actual computation and interpretation, it's usual to go to the two-component spinners. Important is uh, you have the M plus and M minus mass. They are the two independent linear combination of the even and the odd sector. And you see they come with a different sign in front of it. I will make the assumption that both are still positive. So the odd mass should not be larger in magnitude, at least, than the even mass. So they have the same sign, but the sign in front is different when you do uh, the expansion. Uh, we'll see what happens with that. Where can these come from? Well, uh, assuming you have a kind of material, what do you allow? You introduce strong spin-orbit couplings, for example. You can also introduce antiferromagnetic order, for example, by allowing for a different spin per sublattice. So basically, you break the sublattice symmetry, which can generate the gap uh, between the, the cones in equivalent sublattices. And uh, this gives, let's say, the even uh, mass sector. And then the odd mass sector, which is more or less the Haldane sector, comes from a strong spin orbit coupling, which gives a spin valley uh, interaction. This kind of, uh, let's say, models or ways to get it were, I think, uh, introduced for the first time by Lee and colleagues in this paper. And other materials and, uh, let's say, um, uh, effective Hamiltonians were written down in this paper. And a, more of, a, let's say, some mathematical details of it were in the master thesis of a student of last year, uh, Lucas. You can rewrite this not in the, let's say, four component spinner language, but using the different uh, SU2 uh, generators. So one is the valley SU2, the other one is the sublattice uh, index. So we have a delta coupling and a delta coupling, small and big delta. And uh, the masses that we eventually use per spin sector are given by the linear combination but, uh, let's say, changed by the spin S. So important, the sign of the spin enters the masses and changes the sign uh, of these. That will be, uh, well, actually, this will be the reason that we want to split uh, the cones uh, in the spin sector. So we want, for example, the up sector away and only keep the down sector, because uh, the sizes of the masses are still degenerate in spin space, of course. So we want to avoid that. That's blah, blah, quantum field theory, blah, blah, in a sense. The question is, do such materials exist? On paper, yes. In reality, that's a different question. So uh, the material we found by looking at many other papers uh, is written down here. Uh, yeah, I don't like to pronounce the name because it's a bit difficult, but I will try. It's manganese, chalco, geno, phosphate. Uh, it's one of these TMDs, I think, uh, written down here. Uh, this exists in bulk material. Uh, people are trying to uh, make it uh, really 2D by trying to exfoliate it. So, but uh, as far as I know, it's not yet manufactured really 2D. But there is hope, at least also coming from simulations, that it could be stable in a 2D uh, context. Uh, this is uh, done uh, by uh, Felipe Matusalem from Unicamp and Alexander. is a simulation of this kind of material. It has the properties of antiferromagnetic order and uh, spin valley coupling and so on. Uh, and if you look at uh, the bands and the zoom of the bands, uh, you see indeed 
Red and black are the spin uh, polarizations, are different. Uh, the mass gaps are also different between uh, the two valleys. So all the requirements of our model, uh, or what we have in mind to put in our QED, so the co continuum field theory, at least are consistent with this kind of material. Maybe it's not really a strict honeycomb material anymore, but we do expect that the low energy excitations around the K and the K prime point are still well described by a kind of Dirac uh, equation. So that's uh, what we really need. For those interested, uh, please check the paper and the numbers uh, are more or less okay. So, Let's put all of this in RQD. Well, what's RQD? Uh, let me return to maybe first uh, four-dimensional QED. Why? Uh, well, at the end, the electromagnetic interaction is still living in the bulk. Uh, it's not only a planar uh, electromagnetic interaction. You have to start with the full electromagnetic interaction. So A here is the gauge field, the original, let's say, gauge field mediating the electromagnetic coupling. And we assume that the currents, which represent uh, the fermions, are strictly planar. So we restrict them uh, to the plane. So there is no third component. Nothing escapes. So this is zero. How do you get to the, let's say, effective theory? You integrate out exactly the, the fermions up to the masses, which I don't uh, have not written here because uh, they will not play a role because the masses don't immediately couple to A, uh, for example. You can do this, and if, of course, uh, you find something gauge invariant. It's still a gauge theory. So uh, what you have is the transverse projection of the photon propagator, the 4D photon propagator, uh, connecting the two uh, currents where the sum, of course, is restricted to the three dimensions you take into account. So this is the effective theory. And this you can then uh, rewrite. Notice this effective uh, theory here. The gauge uh, parameter is out uh, since yeah, this is all gauge invariant, what's written there. So this psi is no longer present there uh, because you have integrated it out. But this then you can rewrite again by introducing what you could call an auxiliary field, a new photon field. So the A here is different from the A there. Eh? This is a new A, maybe A tilde, but yeah, we are lazy, so we take the same notation. And you, you can rewrite this is the, if you integrate here, the new photon field away, you will end up with this theory. But it's still a gauge theory. It looks funny, but it's a gauge theory. So you cannot do this unless you introduce a new gauge fixing, of course. And this is the reason, this is the same zeta which was uh, introduced by Alfredo. I know in the paper by Gorbar, uh, they connect the psi and the zeta, but you don't have to do this. These are two different gauge theories. You can gauge fix as you want. Your physics will not depend on it. It's true, uh, this zeta has a mass, but this mass uh, is uh, coupled to something which is uh, trivial in the BRST sense. So it will not enter any physical quantity. It's like using the Coulomb gauge, which breaks Lorentz invariance, but your physics will not have a Lorentz invariance uh, broken. So it's the same, so you can co perfectly control this. This mass, uh, massive zeta will not enter anything physical. So it's, uh, let's say, in a trivial a sector decoupled from your uh, physics. Okay, no questions up to here. So this is still set up and some details. Uh, so, well, I should have also uh, referred to the talk of Danielle, but I was unaware of your topic. So, uh, of course, there's also connection with what you are doing. RQD also attracted attention from, let's say, our true high energy physics colleagues, which with I mean string theorists. Uh, there's quite some activity uh, nowadays in conformal field theories with defects and boundaries. Uh, these are two, but it's not the only papers where they also look at RQD in the sense that uh, they, you look at normal electromagnetism in the bulk with nothing else. You could call it a CFT. And you put then a, a fermionic matter on a boundary. Then you have a coupling of a CFT to some boundary stuff. And you get uh, interaction as all kinds of things. So there's a whole business on that and separate conferences. So feel free to check the literature. Why it's so interesting? Well, uh, ultra relativistic RQED, meaning that the Fermi velocity is put equal to the uh, speed of light, is exactly scale invariant. Uh, I say scale invariant and not conformal because it's not clear to me if it's really conformal. It's not always the same. Uh, for some people it is, but in, it's not exactly the same. What would I mean is what we could show is that the beta function of the electromagnetic coupling is exactly zero. And this follows basically from gauge invariance. You use the, the Slavnov-Taylor identity to good use, and then you can prove that it is true. 
Does this help the scale invariance for our materials? No, because it's no longer true. The scale invariance is immediately broken as soon as you go away from the fixed points. Basically, the speed of light is a fixed point of your theory. An infrared fixed point in true materials, the VF is much smaller. You do have one loop anomalous dimension, and of course, also higher order anomalous dimensions. So everything runs. Uh, there are several papers discussing this. I think this is a, a good one. Is a kind of review by uh, Maria Vosmediano. So feel free to check. So it's interesting, but it is not really interesting, I think, for material physics. What is this Coleman-Hill uh, theorem? Uh, well, it's related, but although not completely the same as the parity anomaly. So in an odd uh, dimensionality, meaning even space uh, dimensionality, you can have an anomaly. You don't have the chiral anomaly. You have the parity anomaly in the sense that you can generate churn simons terms, which break uh, T uh, invariance, and the, genera uh, the generated uh, churn simons is proportional to the sign of the fermion masses. Strictly speaking, I think it should only be called an anomaly if the mass is zero, and then here you have the problem, yeah, is the mass positively zero or negatively zero, so that generates uh, this kind of structures in. You don't always have it, it really depends. Do you have a one, two spinner? Or do we have four spinors? Then you have two two spinors, and so the anomaly can cancel. So depending on uh, the exact, let's say, matter content of your models, you do or do not have the dynamical churn simons uh, term. Uh, this happens in normal QED. I'm talking here about uh, two plus one QED. Uh, so the E square here has a dimension. It's a 3D theory. This means this thing has, uh, looks like a mass, and this is a topological photon mass. It's called topological, although it doesn't really have a topological meaning, uh, let's say, in R3, but uh, it's because it looks very much like a topological uh, quantity. What Coleman and Hill showed is that uh, you can compute uh, this turn Simon's term. This is actually already the zero momentum limit. Of course, what they really were after is the polarization tensor, and the polarization tensor at zero momentum uh, is one loop exact. Uh, I think they showed this in the ultra relativistic limits uh, using diagrams, and, uh, but it's important because it shows that this quantity doesn't renormalize. This is the, the mass itself is, a, let's say, an RG invariant in a sense. What is the big difference with RQED? Well, first of all, we will allow for a Fermi velocity, which is not the speed of light, and the coupling E square is still the normal four-dimensional electromagnetic coupling although renormalizing differently because the matter is different you put in the theory. But this is dimensionless, meaning you will also find this kind of structure, but it's not a topological photon mass. It's, uh, it's a parameter in the game. And I think the, the photon propagator shown by Alfredo nicely slow that the theta parameter enters the propagator, but not as a mass. It's a kind of filtry normalization, I would call it. Uh, and you can easily see if theta uh, becomes larger and larger, the propagator becomes smaller and smaller. So you could say your electromagnetic coupling uh, becomes weaker and weaker, which is, I guess, the reason that your critical coupling becomes larger and larger, because it always comes with propagators attached to it, of course. So that, I think, explains also the change of the critical coupling in the previous talk. So we were able to generalize the Coleman-Hill theorem to the context of RQD. It's a little bit different. Uh, we didn't use diagrams. Basically, we did uh, infrared power expansions of the Slavnov-Taylor identity, which is gauge invariance at the end of the day. So in a sense, the Coleman-Hill theorem follows from gauge invariance. And we were able to extend the proof also to the non-relativistic case. So sh shortly said, massive two-spinner, you will get a dynamical churn simons uh, term in the RQED case, and its zero, uh, uh, zero momentum limit is one loop exact. Why is this important? Because we will uh, compute, uh, let's say, a quantum hole a conductivity with it, which is directly related to the churn simons term. So it's good that also from the field theory viewpoint, it's a fixed number. I mean, it will not receive further correction. So it sounds topological if you compute it from quantum field theory, although you're not using any topological argument at that point. Eh? You're just computing a Feynman diagram. Uh, we, well, we checked what happened, so uh, I will spare you the technical details. It's just an exercise in Feynman diagram. So this is the full polarization tensor. Uh, mu is the chemical potential. I use here one massive uh, 
a two spinner. So this is the, what you find, uh, and you can take the zero momentum limit, and this is the result you get. So you recognize a uh, very similar uh, quantity as in the original Coleman Hill theorem. Where does it enter? I'm not going to explain this. This is more or less the standard formulation. Uh, it's a bit tricky at some point, because in RQED, what you want to do to get the, um, uh, the quantum hole current you have to introduce a background electric field. That electric field, strictly speaking, comes from four dimensions. So what we did to be careful is we first introduced the background field in 4D and only then integrated out the quantum fluctuations of the photon field to get the effective theory with inclusion of the four-dimensional background field. But at the end of the day, it works out nicely and you find the same result as if uh, in the normal case. So what you find is there's the possibility of a transverse current, uh, and the whole uh, conductivity is related to this correlation function, which is, roughly speaking, is current-current, but as we know, is the gluon polar, uh, not the gluon, the photon polarization, and so on. So you can use this result to get a number for this, and at the end of the day, what do you get? Uh, this. This is again for a single two-component spinner. But let me now return to our setup. There we had uh, several two-component spinners. Remember, uh, we have uh, valleys, we have spin indices, and so on. So we put everything back together. It's always this structure, but you have, you have to sum over the spin uh, polarizations, and you have to sum over the two valleys or the two chiralities. And this is the result we get. Notice uh, the chemical potential uh, plays a role here, so it should be located in the gap, so to say, to get a contribution. But what did we do? I made a few assumptions, uh, which are fulfilled by the material I showed you, the numerical material. So I assume that both uh, the masses are positive and that the mu is located in between the two. That means uh, one of the two uh, vanishes because yeah, the theta function is zero. So we are left with a single contribution. An annoying thing was that the two spin polarization had opposite masses, they, so they would cancel upon summation. But that uh, we overcame by assuming there's a gap in spin space as well, in the polarization space, so only one of them will contribute. The other one will be out uh, of the game. So at the end of the day, what do we find uh, is uh, the whole conductivity up to a small detail. There's a factor of one half here because you don't have two. So it seems from the bulk perspective, we can find uh, half integer ant anomalous quantum hole conductivity in this kind of materials. Assuming that the bulk Q of T perspective is correct, and this might be more tricky than it seems. Uh, why? Well, uh, usually if you say this, uh, people say you are crazy. It should be integer because it's a topological quantity, and topological numbers are integers and not half integers. So, well, in certain contexts, you can have the ha half integers, for example, if you work with topological insulators, but that's not what we are doing. So let's try to uh, understand where it comes from and what might be the weak details. How much more time do you have? Three minutes. Yeah. Oh, I have to speed up. Uh, half topology in the bulk. Uh, this is a known formula. It's the TKNN formula. It gives the really the topological meaning of the quantum hall conductivity by massaging the Cooper relation, and then you get a sum over churn numbers which are evidently integers. So why do we get a half integer? Well, it's a bit, uh, yeah, well, it's not uh, dirty what we did, but in a sense it's dirty mathematically speaking. We cut the band, so in principle you have to integrate over all the bands which are smooth uh, curves in a sense, but if you start cutting in it, that's not a smooth mathematical operation. So you are uh, disturbing a bit, let's say, what you're allowed to do as a topologist. But still the one half has a kind of topological meaning, why? Uh, in this paper, but probably it's not the only one, but it's uh, nicely shown that in principle, if you have an effective Hamiltonian of this type, uh, you have two uh, cones. Each cone contributes with a half uh, unit of topological charge, and this half unit is, is also quite stable in the sense if you don't perturb too much around the cone, you will always find that one half. So since we are close to one of the cones and the other one is out of the game, we will always find one half for small perturbations around it. So in a sense, it's a bit topological, but it's not strictly topological because at some point you have to do something discontinuous. But it matches with the Q of T viewpoint where we saw, ah, but it's one loop exact. This is the Coleman Hill theorem. So we always find one half, and this is confirmed from, let's say, the uh, topology. 
What's a bit tricky maybe here? Uh, let me first go this time. Well, in the bulk, uh, we are using quantum field theory. That means the space we are working over is no longer the compact Brillouin zone, which is a torus, uh, but actually it's the whole uh, plane R square. Now, strictly speaking, uh, the kind of integral over the Berry curvature, which gives the churn number, uh, is only well defined if you work over a compact space. Well, R2 is compact for most topologies. You just add infinity, and that saves the day the compactification of the plane. But that's a bit tricky. It means I have to say something about p going to infinity of our model, so I have to uv complete it. I can do that, uh, but you have to be very careful because that's not always well defined in the sense, depending on how you go to infinity and the p square plane, you find a different result. Uh, how can you do that in practice? Well, that's by adding p square corrections. Uh, that's done frequently in toy models of uh, materials. So you add something in p square, then your uh, p going to infinity limit is well defined and unique. You can do the compactification of r square and you do find a very nice result. The tricky point is, uh, well, in a real material, you have several types of p square corrections, which is what Marcelo said, I think. If you expand further uh, in the lattice model, you find a whole set of p squares, so it's unclear which kind of uh, quantum filter you will find. But you can do it, you have to compute with it, but I don't know for the moment, for example, how the churn simons term will be influenced and so on, so that's an open question. Can we try to, uh, one more minute, I think. Uh, 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 from the edge perspective, what is the bulk edge correspondence? In most uh, cases, not always, but in most cases, you can understand, uh, let's say, the whole conductivity, and the bulk runs everywhere, but the real material has boundaries, and it's, uh, it appears, oh, it appears, I mean, it, it is the case that actually the current runs mostly uh, along the boundary or the edge. And you can show that both are topological and are actually the same number. This was proven, I think, for the first time uh, on a lattice model. So not, this is not continued by Hatsugai uh, a, few, well, a few years. It's already many years ago. Uh, this is uh, mathematical. Of course, uh, this was introduced before by physicists in a more loose way, but at the end, they are the same. A beautiful way to do, let's say, uh, an intuitive physical picture is in the famous Boutiker paper. A very mathematically rigorous paper is this one, uh, but at the end, it's more or less the same. Let's see in our model, can we find edge modes? Uh, yes, but very tricky. Uh, if you introduce edges, your Hamiltonian needs to be supplemented with extra conditions. Otherwise, uh, you lose uh, the hermeticity or you risk to lose, so you have to add boundary conditions. But the topology can depend on your boundary conditions, so you can find different results different depending on what you do. A nice overview with examples is this paper. We will use the zigzag edge, so we will cut uh, along the border and you will get this. So if you remember the honeycomb material, it's either the A or the B sublattice, which is the terminating edge. Do we have uh, Hermitian extension? Yes. Basically, you will recognize no flux uh, or toggle to the boundary. And then you can show a Hermitian extension actually corresponds for a two-spinner that uh, on the edge, it behaves like this. Uh, so phi is an angle. It corresponds to uh, that the two and the one uh, component are the same up to factor zeta, which can be any real number, including plus and minus infinity. The zeta zero corresponds to the zigzag, and the zeta to infinity corresponds to the other zigzag edge. You can compute zero uh, edge modes, zero, I mean zero modes. Uh, they do exist. Condition is uh, the mass should be larger than the chemical potential. So in our case, only one of the two will have an edge mode. This is the dispersion relation and the condition for their existence. Then you can feed this into, a, let's say, a conductivity relation and compute. And the very nice thing is that uh, you find that the edge conductivity is related to the sign of the zeta. And there's a contribution if the sign of the zeta is the same sign of the mass. If this is not the case, you find an edge conductivity which is zero. And that's uh, the, the tricky part. This is uh, explained uh, nicely in Gruber and Leitner. Uh, assume that M plus is positive and zeta, I, I'm interested in the AH zigzag. I have to send zeta to zero. But the problem is, how do you send zeta to zero from the left or the right? Uh, depending on how you take the edge, uh, you get a contribution or not. So the result is not well defined. It's either uh, one plus or minus one or zero. 
And this is solved uh, in a loose way by saying, yeah, but uh, yeah, this, uh, you have to take the mean value, so you have one half. Which is true, but this is a bit dirty, I would say. Uh, this is another paper doing it from a more physical viewpoint. This is, let's say, very mathematical. This is very physical, but at the end, it's the same. So they say you have to take uh, the mean value, and this would explain the one half from the edge perspective. So you still have a bulk edge correspondence, but uh, this is, remains to be seen. And uh, what we are looking at now is maybe uh, we have to include some uh, averaging, uh, and, and, and let's say, um, Physical way of averaging is allowing from some disorder on the boundary. You could say, yeah, your, born, your boundary will never be a perfect zigzag. Maybe it will be zeta very, very small on one side, but also very, very small on the other side. So you have to sample over these, and maybe th th then you will have a proper sampling, let's say, over positive and negative zetas, which corresponds to a conductivity or not. So that remains to be seen what will come out. So what we will do the coming time is uh, numerically investigate the material and the conductivities itself, so we will uh, not feed any more uh, assumptions in it, we will just let the simulation, the DFT simulation uh, do its work. Hopefully, uh, if that works out, we need to understand better from the analytical viewpoint. Other materials with similar gap structures do exist, and uh, related maybe to the last thing that Alfredo talked about was the chiral magnetic effect. It's strictly 2D. Uh, it's not so trivial, I think, to couple a magnetic field to that. You need to allow for an extension in the third dimension, which is always there since the 2D material is never really flat. There's always an extension related to the, let's say, the thickness of the orbitals. The question is, do you still have a kind of parity anomaly in this kind of setup? So I don't know, so that's something to look at in the future. So thank you for your patience and enjoy the lunch. Questions? Hey David, thank you for the very nice talk. So yeah. I have a like very naive question from memories from many many years ago on the usual quantum Hall effect and and half integer quantum Hall effect. So why don't you have something like the usual quantum integer quantum Hall effect uh, in this case if you have uh, a physical picture? Ba basically because only one of the cones contributes uh, and the usual the two right. cones contribute, so they add up or they cancel depending on which setup you are. Then you would have yeah. the usual integer yeah. one, right? I and think some, uh, maybe in uh, Daniel's talk, there was this, what Anna asked, there were very strange signs in between. Uh, I, uh, can they cancel, Daniel? I didn't ask because there was no time, but I can ask now. <laughs> At some point, you also <laughs> wrote down the whole conductivity, and you had the sign of something and the sign of something very different. They always cancel. Yeah. Look, it depends on, on the nature of the matter sample. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the, other, the reason, it depends right, on... Uh, right, makes yeah. sense. And the other thing is that, I mean, the usual uh, setup would have like very low temperatures and very large magnetic fields, and if you went to, to have the, this uh, fractional Hall effect, you needed even larger magnetic fields. Probably. So is there any analogy here uh, with this kind of scenario and Barry's phases and, and so on and so forth? Maybe, but this I don't know. Yeah. We didn't look at it. I guess, yeah, we can add temperature and so on using the right distribution functions. We would need to see what happens. With Any Laughlin no topological construction or something like this? Maybe. Could yeah. be. OK. Yeah. But, yeah. Thank you. We would already like to solve this first because it's still unclear, and then maybe we can generalize. Okay. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. More questions? Just a comment about what Eduardo just asked. I mean, it's a bit tricky to add temperature because it's not to add like uh, fluctuations or whatever, but you have to check if your Hamiltonian will, will not be changed. So if you were working, for example, with a ferromagnetic material and you start with a Hamiltonian and you uh, rise your temperature, then the Hamiltonian will change. So it's not only to uh, uh, apply a thermal bath, but you have to check your, your first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. No. Um, I, I'm curious about the uh, when you were discussing the topology and you had to compactify the space. You went to p goes to infinity, 
there are ambiguities and all that stuff. But it seems that there is a natural uh, possibility of actually considering two band model, if you wish that uh, simplest model that gives you two bands, then the topology shouldn't be an issue and you should basically reproduce the same physics and know the topology. Am I missing something? So again, the last question, uh, the last sentence. Uh, if you use that two-band model, yes. then basically you will have a finite brilliant zone. So yeah, the yeah, topology yeah. will be determined from that compact on brilliant the, zone. On the compact it, lattice, yeah, yeah, right. yeah, that's true. That yeah. shouldn't be a difficult exercise with all this stuff that you calculated with all the response. It should be... Uh, you mean putting our model uh, back in its lattice? Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, 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 that's true. And that's one of the things I think... Uh, oh, so it's I, a task to do. Versus, yeah, yeah, it's to okay, do, uh, okay. to, to return to the lattice and see what happens okay. there. I misunderstood that, thanks. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious to know if uh, you can uh, see onions, onions in your... Uh, Maybe, but I don't have... Uh, an answer to that. Uh, All, right. Yeah. All right, thanks. Probably we have to add something else. Then. Uh, hi, so the, uh, I have a question about the uh, Chan Simon's action. So the, when you talk about the Chan Simon's action, the originally, so the starting point is that the fermions live in 2 plus 1, but the gauge fields are in a 3 plus 1 dimensions, yes? And then uh, after doing this, some uh, reduction, or you get some effect, some, some, some description, or into plus one, but the gauge field originally lived in a two plus one, while uh, your uh, topological chance Simon's action is, of course, the two plus one dimensional uh, expression. So I, I, I'm very much confused uh, about that because, uh, you know, it, it yeah, it's not a Chern Simons uh, in the original uh, electromagnetic field. It's in the new one, uh, the auxiliary field, if you wish. Uh, but, but does it mean that you have the parity anomaly in 2 plus 1, or uh, do you still retain the chiral anomaly in 3 plus 1 dimension? Uh, the yeah, that, I, that, the, that the parity anomaly I comes, I think, from the fermions who live in, a, they do live in one dimension less, and they do generate the parity anomaly. Also, if the bulk electromagnetic field is 4D, mm. it's mm. the fermions uh, generating this uh, churn Simons term. Okay, okay, yeah. okay, okay. More questions? So, if you do not have more, please thank David. Yeah. And the chairman. <laughs> so, we close the section now. Please. Yeah, but I think you can come back later. So, we're a bit late, so let's.